So uh, Tamar uh, Kidashelli uh, is, uh, is a good friend from Georgia. She is the uh, founder and director of the Democracy uh, Research Institute, but you have been also uh, the fellow with the Prague Civil Society Center. You have spent uh, some time uh, of your professional career also in the politics. You have been the member of the parliament. And I don't know whether you started there, but you have also kind of spent some time with uh, with the uh, Georgian Young Lawyers uh, Association. And my impression is that everybody who is doing something good in Georgia has been uh, with the, with the Georgian Young uh, Lawyers right. Association. <laughs> so it's a it's a certain kind of the twenty years of the of the experience of um, uh, being in a democratic activism. Uh, so. Uh, how would you say the kind of the, when we look what's happening in today's world in many countries, the, the young generation, the so-called uh, Gen Zs, mm -hmm. have uh, been really the driving force and the triggering force, mm -hmm. which basically kind of the, uh, moved the whole societies into the mass protests. They have been usually kind of the first one, and then they mobilized the other segments of the of the society. And in, even in some cases, they have been seen as somebody who was bringing def different generations together. So, uh, what has been the role of the young people in Georgia uh, recently? In, uh, there has been a mass protests, and uh, what the young people, whether they have played a role in Georgia as well. Well, for over a year, I remember that there was always a complaint from, uh, like, from here, heard from everywhere that young people are not coming to the street and they are not protesting and they are not interested in anything. They are not interested in politics. But now the stereotype has been broken. Uh, last year, it was the first time when the youth, the students, came in big numbers and huge numbers to the street and they together with us civil society organizations and media protested this foreign agents law and it was like really the first time that i remember that uh, students in that amount that that students really become the driving force of the protest of course i do remember in 2003 but afterwards there was a huge gap when the youth was not interested uh, in the developments in the country, I mean political developments in the country. And do we have and some, some knowledge or some uh, uh, understanding what has driven them now, why now? I think, that, um, I think that this is the generation that actually benefited from, uh, from the benefits from Europe. I mean, they, they, we had this visa-free regime with Europe from 2016 and uh, people have been able to go to Europe and also to benefit all from all the ideas of freedom and democracy. And these young people came out to defend democracy, to defend the European future of Georgia. I mean, uh, the question of Europe was the main trigger for them. They understood quite quickly as they understood that this was not the law about NGOs and media, and this was the law about the uh, the future of Georgia and therefore they came out to the street into the huge numbers. I remember last year uh, we CSOs and media have been standing behind the uh, parliament building and when the uh, uh, bill was passed with the he first hearing by that time and all of us texted come to the parliament, come to the parliament and then I remember the mo moment that we went from the back of the parliament in front of the parliament building at Rustaveli Avenue. And I was so surprised to see huge amount of people and mainly students and youngsters who were there and who were supporting us. And this year there, there were even bigger numbers and they were absolutely major force, driving force in these demonstrations. Without them, I don't think that there will be anything done. And they trusted us. I mean, they trusted because they knew that uh, it's the it's the future of the country that is at stake. So, to to answer your question, yes, the youth is very active in Georgia and, uh, now. And from outside, the the kind of, it looked like that uh, the protests are ma massive. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked like that there is really again wakening wakening up of the Georgian society. Uh, uh, but do we? having this moment a little bit better understanding what is the sociology behind the protests. Which groups, social and professional groups, joined mm -hmm. and which social and professional groups did not join? Let's see. Do we have a little bit understanding? Well, yes, just a little bit. Not, not in-depth understanding, but of course we had the 
professors, professors of the universities joining the protest and they have been boycotting the uh, educational process and some of the universities stood um, the, in support of the protest. Also we had representatives, oh theatres, art people, yeah I forgot that. It's, it has been, I mean, it's so contingent because, um, I didn't pronounce the word properly, but uh, the, uh, the, the artists, uh, actors, uh, at the end of the um, uh, performances, they have been coming out uh, with the protests, saying that no to Russian law. And I, I don't remember anything like that before. So it's, it was like really extraordinary. And once again, realization that, you know, this touched upon all the segments of the society. Doctors, doctors have been joining us and coming out. To a lesser extent, uh, public officials, those who are employed at the public institutions, because understandably they are afraid of losing their jobs and etc. because there could be some um, repressions against them. But uh, yeah, uh, musicians, of course the art people I already said, the, the professors, doctors, um, use um, to CSOs and media of course. Yeah. And is it um, so? The, in a certain way, the the, the Russian law has activated uh, the significant part of the society. Uh, whether that has already had an impact on a, on a political actors, whether the political actors have been transformed, whether they are going through the process of uh, regaining legitimacy, regaining the you know <laughs> vitality. Or we still don't know how this weakening up of the society will be reflected on the political players. Yeah, we still don't know, but um, this has been the public protest and the political parties have not been the major driving force in mobilizing people because uh, so far, uh, unfortunately, they have not been very active. They, they have not been very successful in that direction. But there is also an understanding within a big part of these people who, who have been demonstrating that at some point polit political forces should take over because at the end of the day uh, they, we, we, we are ready to change the government only through the peaceful ways and this can be done only on the elections and this can be done only through the political parties. Political parties, I, I would say, they have been listening to the to the voice of the public. So I mean, they have been following. It was it was differently. Not political parties leading, but uh, 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 vice versa. Uh, political parties following following the public. But this is the moment that they have to have to get uh, have to get more more active. And I'm very happy that the president of Georgia, Salome Zurabishvili, she is playing very good role in that and uh, she promulgated charter and she called on the political parties to join and most of the opposition parties like more or less major players already joined it. So, um, so the political parties are getting activated but of course we expect more from their side. Uh, yeah, but yeah. but they are not. Um, do we we want more from them. Yeah, yeah. We want more. okay. And um, the but I just steal this yes. because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the um, look uh, in a. It might sound a little bit simplified, but still it can help us a little bit in analysis. That uh, uh, when we looked. Uh, couple of important elections that are happening again in a number of countries in Europe and outside of the Europe, uh, it looks like almost that we have on one side the politics of aspirations, mm -hmm. of the kind of the positive narrative for the country, and on the other side we have a politics of the fear mm -hmm. and of the protection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and politics of aspiration can be typical case in Ukraine, we aspire to the European Union, uh, here in the Czech Republic it has been, we want to prevent, prevent uh, Czech exit, exit of the Czech Republic. So, so on one side positive narrative and on the other side uh, populist political players are playing these roles. Um, there is a reasons for fear. Mm -hmm. We need to be afraid 
and we are the only one to be protected. Is that kind of the competition between the politics and mobilization around the hope, around the aspirations, and the politics and uh, mark, political marketing around fear and we will protect you from the dangerous world. Is that playing in a Georgia as well? Yeah, well, absolutely. That's the Georgian dream. That's the narrative, the last one that you outlined. That's the narrative of the Georgian dream. That they are saying that we are the only ones who can protect Georgia from opening the second front, mm -hmm. whatever it means. <laughs> And uh, so they are capitalizing on the fear of the Georgian society that of course exists because of the 2008 war. And uh, this, um, this, that they are often playing this image that, you know, uh, uh, 2014, uh, Ukraine, Maidan, and what happened with Ukraine, they are playing this image of war. And afterwards they are saying, this, this, this is the protest in Georgia right now and what will happen afterwards. So, so they are trying to present, I mean, and they are not, not only to present, in the, but openly saying that there will be uh, Ukraine in Georgia, like in, in, I mean, war in Georgia, um, if we will not guarantee your security. But on the other hand, we have this, uh, uh, people, not, not necessarily political forces, political forces, as I said, more following public, but people who, who say that, you know, the only way for us, I mean, to, to survive is with the European Union and with the NATO umbrella above us. So there is this competition and the, everything that is related to with, with these narratives, I mean, also um, kind of as if, um, like, protection of the traditional values, whatever it means, uh, not necessarily Georgian values, but like something imported most probably from Russia and this protection is that we will protect you. But, and unfortunately, to some extent, it still, it still plays it because plays people, well. people are, afra yeah. are, are afraid, not used, but yeah. around. Yeah, we have seen yes. it's also kind of, it has been, you know, in, in a certain way, surprisingly effective yes. in the case of the Hungary. You know, the, the Orban very, very successfully played this card of the, you know, the Europe and everybody wants to drag you into the war, into the conflict, and I'm the only one who can protect you. It worked very well in the case of the Slovakia. It didn't work in our case, in the case of the Czech Republic. So, so yes, I said, these narratives are in a certain way... Absolutely. False, yes. <laughs> false, yes. false, but effective. And very clearly stated that there is this global war party. The Georgian dream is saying that there, there exists some global war party, some masons, mm -hmm. who, who want to drag Georgia into war. And when, we, when they are asked who are these global war party, of course they, they are saying the collective national movement. So, I mean, they, <laughs> it's, they don't name. It, yeah, they don't, they don't name. And it's funny if you Google this Global War Party, you will see only the photos of the officials of the Georgian dream. <laughs> uh, and what about uh, you know, Russian, Russian kind of influence in Georgia? Let's say basically, majority of the jo all opinion surveys are showing that majority of the Georgian population is pro European, yes. basically because of the very complicated, very bad history. Majority of the Georgian population is very, very kind of skeptical or afraid uh, uh, toward Russia. But on the other side, Russia is very, very successful in penetrating in a different society and using different institutions, different uh, channels, how to enter and try to uh, influence the public opinion to spread the polarization in a society. Is it something like that happening in Georgia now? And if yes, what are the main instruments? What are the main entry points? What are the main narratives which this R Russian propaganda is using to influence the Georgian uh, public opinion? Unfortunately, there have not been any state policy against this Russian propaganda. And this was one of the demand before this a law was activated. This was one of the demand of the civil society organizations to the authorities of Georgia, do, do something, do something against this Russian propaganda. But uh, I'm not surprised. The Georgian dream is actually, actually repeating the messages of the Russian propaganda, that Europe is all about the LGBTIQ, that uh, Europe is stealing our identity, so that in Europe there is no uh, uh, respect for the traditional values and things like that. So. Unfortunately, uh, before, uh, before two years ago, we had some, uh, before one year ago even, we had um, some uh, very clearly pro-Russian political parties recently created who have been voicing this narrative. But Georgian Dream was kind of refraining from, uh, from repeating that. But right now they do not need this uh, pro-Russian 
of far-right political parties because they are saying all the Russian propaganda messages themselves regarding Ukraine, regarding Europe, regarding the US, who is our strategic partner, and etc. So, um, so what we see right now is that um, the first it was that uh, the messages of the far-right groups openly pro-Russian and the messages of the Georgian dream was similar. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, these far-right groups were put aside and the Georgian dream is voicing these messages. Yes. And in addition to the, the kind of the far-right groups and, uh, and the Georgian dream, uh, is there, let's say, also a certain kind of increased penetration of the Russian influence in you know, either Georgian media or maybe there are some kind of new civil society or illiberal civil society popping up because that is something what we have seen in other countries, let's say penetrating through the social media, penetrating through the media, penetrating through the different businesses, penetrating through the illiberal civil society. So, so is there something like that happening in Georgia? Well, as we know, there are some non-governmental organizations that are supported uh, from Russia, but they are not that uh, effective. Yeah and they are not that effective and influential. On the other hand, there, uh, these far-right groups that I was talking about, they have their media outlets, and they, I mean, they have this 24-hour broadcasting, and so they can reach quite a wide segment of the population, and it, it's a danger. But as I, as I told you, this group has been put aside by the Georgian dream because they have been doing this. But on the other hand, we have also the uh, governmental TV channels who are, I, I cannot say that, uh, but I do not have evidence that they are supported financially from Russia, but they are repeating the messages mm -hmm. of this information, that something that is against our strategic partners of Europe and the US. So it's on the, unfortunately, it's on the governmental level, this disinformation, this, this, this uh, negative narratives against EU and against the US is coming from the level of the government. The government. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what about uh, Georgian Church? I say, how Georgian Church is influential in a society? Is it influential? And if it is influential, whether in any way uh, Georgian Church is or can be the uh, institution making a political influence in one or another direction? Georgian Church is very influential, and all the governments in Georgia have been understand had the understanding of that, and they have been trying to be friends with the Georgian Church, and this is with the pre with current government as well. Unfortunately, there is understanding among the civil society actors that the, uh, within the Georgian church there is more inclination towards Russia rather than towards the Europe. And as they have very influential role and they have plenty of people following them, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah. Um, uh but it's a very sensitive topic. Yeah, yeah. It's a very sensitive topic, and the Georgian authorities have been using it against civil society organizations mm -hmm. and against critical media and against opposition as well, who, who managed to, uh, who, had, who had been brave enough to raise voices against the church. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the narrative by the Georgian dream is that these are the forces who are fighting Georgian church. church. But in, in reality, as I said, Unfortunately, in the Georgian Church, mm -hmm. there is this feeling that the majority is pro-Russian. And uh, are you expecting this that? Was yeah, yeah. Sorry. Are you expecting that uh, uh, really mass-scale election fraud can happen in uh, Georgia in uh, upcoming elections? I don't exclude ever anything okay. because. Uh, previous elections, well, there have been irregularities, of course, and we always had irregularities. Yeah, yeah. They have been like very exceptional elections that have been like really done mm -hmm. in accordance with the international standards. We, we didn't have like really mass scale violations. There have been plenty of problems, but not mass scale. But this time I really don't exclude anything because it's clear that the Georgian dream is ready for anything in order to, to, to stay in power. That's why they started this foreign agents law, mm -hmm. that's, di that's why they started this campaign to break our resistance and to 
to have disappointment into the public. So I think that they are ready for everything. They are, they are ready for that. And uh, I'll ask now something what might be wrong question, and yes. please just tell me it's a, it's a wrong observation. It might be also an uh, unpleasant question, but uh, I have visited Georgia let's say, many times, and I a little bit had impression that before, let's say, before the last wave of the protests, I had the impression that uh, Georgian civil society is uh, a little bit elitist. It is a, a very professional, very uh, uh, high quality, expert quality, but in a certain way the Georgian civil society is an elite game playing with the political elites and that there is a certain disconnectivity between the Georgian civil society, at least many of which I have been in contact, and what, you know, somebody would say ordinary people on the street. On the street. Uh, is that observation a wrong one, or maybe there is something in that, and if there is something in that, uh, uh, whether something changed with the last uh, uh, protest, that in a certain way Georgian civil society understood that they we need to go back a little bit uh, in this, what communists have been doing, working with the masses. Because we are today in a, in a, in a mass politics. The, the, our opponents, non-democratic opponents, have really learned how to manipulate the public feelings. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, the question is whether our civil society elite, high expert, high professional uh, work is good enough in order to mobilize the bigger segments of the, of the population? Well, these concerns might be right to some extent, but nevertheless, these elitist NGOs, together with non-elitist NGOs, manage to mobilize people, yeah. manage to, to get the message through. But you are right. I understand the concern in your question. There have been concerns in the Georgian civil society organizations as well. But we will work on that. Uh, I mean, I think that through this process, we will come more empowered and um, uh, yeah, more empowered definitely. And uh, yes, definitely there is a need uh, for some of the NGOs, not all of them, to work more on the ground because it, it won't be fair to, to generalize this on everyone because there are some plenty grassroots organizations who are, I mean, doing tremendous work. And even these um, big NGOs, have been very effective in providing services. Mm -hmm. But we have to work on this, um, I mean, internally, and through this process, I think that we will come up with more empowerment. Do you, are you confident in uh, Europe? That uh, you, are, you aspire, as a Georgian people, yes. to, kind of, to be, you know, to follow the European path? Yes. On the other side, Georgian has been once in a situation when you aspired with the NATO membership when you strongly as a society are sending these messages and you have been abandoned, let's be mm -hmm. frank. Yes. So, so you are now again in a situation when you are sending this strong message, you are waving more European flags than we wave in a Europe, so your message is strong. But uh, in this moment, do you trust Europe? Do you have a confidence that Europe is standing behind you? Yes, to be very honest, maybe we do not expect much, but for us, uh, for me personally, uh, I'm not that young and I have seen some of the things, but for me it was very emotional to see that uh, uh, this uh, high level parliamentarians or foreign ministers are coming and standing in front of the protest demonstrations and they are giving the speeches that they gave. It's very inspiring and you, you can feel that Europe is uh, standing next to you and the attention that we are giving out, that we are receiving from Europe is also very inspiring. We are not asking much. The, the, the support that we are getting is enough. Also, we want a bit more, like uh, as efficient. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's difficult for the European Union to be as efficient as for, for the US because there is, we know how the decisions are, are made, but uh, maybe for the EU individual member states, they can be more proactive with the sanctions, with individual sanctions for individuals who have been responsible for the recent events and for the adoption of this rational law. 
And I personally don't like you know, this kind of dividing Europe in a kind of new Europe, old, old Europe, and so on. But, but in a certain way, when we look at particularly, for example, Ukraine and so on, then the Baltic states, the Central mm. European countries, not all of them, but uh, at least uh, we Czechs and Poles have been really kind of driving force uh, behind the support for the, for the Ukraine. Uh, are you noticing any also kind of the, the different European countries are in a different way uh, seeing and uh, are supporting to you in a Georgia or you see more Europe as a bloc standing behind you? Well, of course I have to say that the Baltic states have been standing next to us and supporting, fiercely supporting us. That This you can feel. Mm. And also I have to outline Germany. Mm. Germany has been like extremely supportive and before receiving the candidate status, we had plenty of very high level delegation, delegations visiting Tbilisi. And we know that Germany played an important role to get candidate status to Georgia. And also this, uh, the parliamentarians, German parliamentarians, and uh, I mean, they are tweeting <laughs> almost all the, each day on Georgia. So it's, we, we feel you, it, you feel yes. Okay. The Baltic states for sure, yeah, yeah. and also Germany and France. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. And my last question would be, and again, this is probably, it's a speculation question. Okay. It's a kind of a tough question. Uh, uh, but again, when I compare, when I observe, let's say, then you see the situation in which kind of regimes are ready to do a lot to defend themselves uh, because they are not popular. But then important difference is whether these regimes have a strong state mm -hmm. in their hands or these regimes don't have a strong state. Uh, and uh, examples is you know, with the help of the Putin, Lukashenko had a strong state, strong repressive state in her hands. When we looked in a Georgia history, the uh, Shevardnadze didn't, didn't have a, had a strong state in her hands. Uh, Serge Sarkisian probably didn't have a, in a critical moment, strong state in hands. Uh, what is the character of the Georgian state now? I'd say whether the Georgian Dream uh, government has a strong state, can they count on the loyal security apparatus uh, to do the crackdown, for example, after election uh, fraud for long months if they are faced with a long, prolonged protest? Or you think that the Georgian state is not capable of the heavy, prolonged crackdown uh, repression? Yeah. Um, I'm really hoping for the second scenario. I really, really do think that uh, Ivanishvili does not have strong state in an understanding that you just described. And uh, I have the feeling that uh, maybe it's a bit naive, but uh, I, I'm hoping at least that the Georgian law enforcers will not be ready to to have uh, these uh, repressions for, for a long, prolonged period of time. Because we can feel some sympathy from uh, among the law enforcers. Mm -hmm. Well, there have been like severe beatings and dispersal of the demonstrations. But it but always, still, always still. is, it always happened. There are always yes. special units which do that, but yes. security apparatus is usually bigger and the regimes in a critical moment needs much bigger loyalty yes. than... I, I really, I doubt, no. I no. doubt that uh, Ivanishvili will have that loyalty because the security law enforcers, I more rely on law enforcers, I, I, I'm like putting my hope on the law enforcers. They have family members and they, they live in this country and the, Georgia is not a big country and everyone knows each other. Mm. So it's, I mean, everything is interrelated. So I'm really, I, I really have hope for that, that, um, that they, they will not be able to use repressions for a prolonged period prolonged of time. Period. Well, of course, we will have these dispersals yeah, yeah. and violence and mm. we already seen it, but uh, not, not, not in a long term. Okay, thank you very much. Let's say it was really, uh, you know, we are hopeful for Georgia. We are kind of, uh, for, we feel Georgia is a kind of part of our big European family. At least we hear that not only the Prague Civil Society Center, but in a, in a Czech, Czech Republic. And, uh, and, and hopefully, let's say the elections will go well and that, uh, the, you know, Georgia has once had kind of the, the change of the government through the democratic means. So hopefully this time we will also have the change of the government in a democratic way. So yeah. good luck. Thanks a lot. Thanks.